All right, we're back. Um, Almost. Good news. Uh, in his kind, gentle way, Darius beat me up, and now I can <laughs> see the time, and I'll stick to time. Bad news, you're getting an additional uh, session after this, so um, don't get your hopes too high. Um, we're talking about launch excellence tracking, and a lot has been said, but I have three wonderful ladies with me. Uh, my challenge, because Daria adds a challenge to every panel, he just doesn't tell the, the moderator. I have two Mayas, which is a, a chance in one in 104,000, um, which is not so easy um, to do. But so we, we discussed, and we would like to take this huge topic, uh, which is the role of medical affairs in launch, and not discuss what is already established, which is, yes, medical affairs has a role to play, thank you for that, and cut it into three parts, before launch, during the launch phase, and after launch, and we'll try to be as efficient of that. And we will start uh, by Maya G, and she agreed that we call her like that, to explain a little bit uh, the launch key plan actions from a medical affairs uh, perspective. Sure, thank you. Um, yes, as we all know, medical is really no longer a support function. It's clear also from one of the earlier sessions and, and what we're hearing at MAPS that medical affairs is really now officially considered a third strategic pillar between commercial and marketing. So the role of medical affairs, I would argue, since you know we're being prov provocative, is that medical affairs is the key function in the preparation of the market for launch. These activities can start, I mean, the earlier, the better. There's a huge strategic component that we're involved in. So the earlier that medical affairs can be involved with our clinical development folks, as early, I would argue, as the development of the target product profile even, but most certainly the pivotal phase three program to ensure that the medical voice is heard that the clinical development colleagues are actually listening to what the needs are in the markets when, as it pertains to market access and reimbursement. Do we have the right endpoints? Are we using the right PROs? Obviously, we can't have all-encompassing phase three studies with endless numbers of patients and limitless budget, but we can already start to incorporate some of those considerations early on. Then, you know, around 24 months before launch comes the tactical piece where we develop the launch plan. And this is really a concrete plan that lists all of the activities that we want to execute in order to enter the market, preparing the market. So beyond the evidence generation piece, which also of course involves HEOR, but I, I don't have all day to talk about that, but then creating the scientific story. You know, that's, that's something really, really pivotal, translating the science into messages, telling the story of our brand, educating our commercial colleagues on the data and jointly developing the messaging around the product, developing materials together, etc. The external engagement piece, which, which Maya will speak to later, of course, and let's not forget the internal readiness. We have to be med info ready, SRLs, FAQs, pharmacovigilance, how are we set up for adverse event reporting? You know, there's also that internal component, making sure everyone is trained on the data, slide decks developed, materials. So there's really a whole host of activities that medical is really instrumental in driving during that really key phase uh, up to two years out for an innovative medicines launch, which could be truncated for a biosimilar launch, for example, but let's just go with that for now. You mentioned all of the ones you said, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so now we shift externally, so that's pre-launch headquarters before 24 months um, influence the whole, the whole data generation after 24 months to point zero, get ready. Then comes the field, Maya B, where, when do you start actually in the field uh, and what do you do? Well ideally you, you can actually slowly shift your resources in the field, but at the latest 12 months prior to launch your field team needs to be ready, meaning they need to be fully trained and reaching out, depending on, you know, if you know your physicians already, if they know the substance, maybe you're just shifting to a different indication. However, it's even more important if you're reaching out to new physicians. You need to fully understand your product, you need to understand the treatment area, and you want to make contact. And the first people you're going to talk to are your investigators, because they're already using your product. This is the most important piece of information in the beginning, because they're actually using it. And they're going to have questions. And you want to learn from those questions. And you want to understand 
the HCP universe that you're going to be working with, and these are what we generally call key opinion leaders. So these are the people who are telling the treaters afterwards about the substance, explaining it, explaining the, um, explaining the treatment. So we want to basically reach out on one hand, but we also want to take a lot of information back. And we can always reach out to physicians to, for example, introduce ourselves if the company is new in the field, so ourselves and the company, and we can always discuss disease state. So we can always be proactive. Someone said something about reactive? No. We can be proactive about this, and we're going to learn about it. And we're going to learn how to explain the, the treatment, the substance, and this will all feed into what Maya mentioned in terms of developing trainings, developing materials. Like I was in a company, we were launching the first checkpoint inhibitors, and we realized in this early phase, we need to do a step back. People don't understand the checkpoint inhibitors as such, not to speak about our product, right? Two years later, I'm a different company. We are launching checkpoint inhibitors. Well, that was established because I did that already. So there's a different attitude, but it's a lot about information sharing and training, but also bringing a lot of information back to the company so that we can adjust the communication that we establish. Thank you, and I want to highlight one thing that Maya said, which is the fact that if it's a new therapy field, it's going to be different timelines and different yeah. activities mm -hmm. from if it's one that you've been active in. And it's sometimes a mistake that people make because they mm -hmm. just treat everything the same. So then, of course, we're ready, and then we go to Zainab already did a presentation on this on measurement. So Zainab, in this stage, what, 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 when do you start setting KPIs, yeah. and, and what, what are the big ones? Uh, back to Paul's question, don't give me a list of 75, give me the top three. Yeah, no, th thank you. And I, I agree with everything that both Maya said. I think the role of medical affairs, uh, that strategic role of medical affairs in launch preparation and launch readiness is super important. And it's becoming more and more important, especially with those kind of truncated launches, because medical, medical affairs can do so much more pre-launch. But what we're also kind of beginning to see and realize is that actually Everyone is pretty good at launching now. Many medical affairs professionals and cross-functional teams have done launches, have done many launches across their careers. Right? So they know what they're doing. They know what needs to happen. They know how to go about it. They, they, they can launch. But what we started to see was that launches were happening differently in different countries, depending on the skill set and the talent that we had available in those countries. So one team was really good at delivering their activities and their launch readiness, and they were doing everything on target and on time, but other teams, perhaps the less mature markets, where the team were more lean, there weren't as, as many headcounts in place, they were struggling with the basic aspects of launch readiness, and that was really impacting their preparation and readiness for launch. And when we started to kind of dig into this a bit more and kind of understand how they're even going about their launches, we, we, we started to learn that they were just basically coming up with their own set of launch readiness activities and their own framework for launch de novo. And they didn't need to do that because they, there is, you know, they, sometimes in the past there hasn't been, but more recently, we've developed a launch playbook and we've developed a launch sure. set of launch readiness activities. And this is nothing that's outside of this world and that, that's new or innovative. This is just a basic set of activities that cross-functionally we need to do in preparation for launch. So, so um, legal are going to kill me that you guys are taking photos, so don't take too many photos. Um, <laughs> but this is, this is a set of activities that we wanted people to be able to refer to in their preparation for launch. And this helped them because they had, they had this um, to help them and guide them in their launch readiness. But as we heard this morning, what then? Like, you know, we, have, we had teams that were given these guidelines and they were given this playbook and they were planning the launch according to this, um, to this set of activities. But we still didn't really have a way to communicate between the teams and between the countries. We weren't able to readily and easily share learnings Go from to one country metrics, time to scaling. another. <laughs> so what we did was we developed a, we developed a simple tool um, within the company, a cross-functional tool that allowed all the countries and all the teams launching all different products and indications to track their launch activities using a single shared platform. The platform was actually also then used to digitize and track our POA activities because we felt like there was a connection. Um, but that's a different topic for another day. And this tool simply allowed us to digitize our launch activities, make sure everyone's tracking the same activities. We tagged activities so we knew exactly 
where medical was responsible or commercial were responsible on market access, legal, public affairs, etc. So we were able to really quickly pull up a list of activities that were supposed to be done by Canada government affairs team in Q2, three months before launch. It was really easy to be able to pull out a list of tactics and a list of activities, run metrics, and really help the team have more cross-functional, data-driven discussions. And obviously, KPIs were then um, were able to be developed because we had so much data. We had so much data on, on our launches, and we were able to share best practices and really help the team um, okay. with their launch activities. So use the tool, go cross-functionally, and with the example of Canada, make sure that you involve your regions early, uh, that you don't, the last one you want to surprise is your countries when you launch. Which brings us to the more controversial part of the launch, because generally my experience is that um, our friends in commercial do not really challenge the role of medical pre-launch. It's when it hits the launch. Is that a signal? No. no. All right. Um, <laughs> it's when the launch. So, but the, here's the, one of the wrong things in medical affairs is something I think the launch, as if it's one thing mm. and all the countries are the same thing. But it's actually a series of events. And that's when things start accelerating because suddenly you have your MSL force, people who are actually already talking to doctors who can prescribe and others who can't. So what changes in the field when you start launching and, and, and how, do you, how do you deal with that? Maya B. So one of the major things is that for most countries and most companies, <clears throat> we are not allowed to speak about the data prior to launch, right? So we're discussing the CS state and things, and we're preparing the speakers, and we're making sure that we have speakers that actually know what they're talking about. However, now the, the teams can go out and actually talk science. And not only like the, the high level, but really making sure that our physicians, especially those that are on stages and being asked questions, that they now understand exactly what the science is and how to communicate it and what the data is actually expressing. So this is where we can actually put the data out there, discuss, learn from it, of course, and then develop from there on. And, and, and Maya B, how do you build that into your plans? Because my experience is if that sharing, that, that capturing the early experience is not pre-planned, it simply does not happen. Everybody gets sucked in. So how do you build that in to do exactly this? Yeah, we, we also have a similar kind of structure in place where we have not only a playbook but also a work instruction with a series of templates where we really provide a framework and a structure around the process. We develop the medical plan, but it's not a static plan that we do once off. We involve the regions very early on, the regions speaking for the countries in their cluster, and we incorporate all of that into the plan. In our launch team meetings, where we convene everybody monthly to discuss, the regional folks are part of those discussions. So really, in addition to executing what's on the plan, we have dashboards where we really track each individual activity, what the outcome of that was, any risks, delays, do we accept that risk, do we mitigate it, how do we mitigate it, what are the learnings, and all of that gets refreshed in the plan. So it's really a fluid document where we continue to build on it such that when we are ready for the regional and down to the country level, we have incorporated all of those learnings. Mm -hmm. So it really should become more and more seamless as it goes on if we are really listening to the voice of the regions and what they need and not working in isolation and mm. not allowing countries and regions to do their own launch planning, develop their own messages. Mm. It should all be very, very consistent. One voice, one approach with, of course, adaptations for each market as needed in order to facilitate access. Yeah, well, thanks for that. But then in the end, it comes down, as we said this morning, it's trust in people. And to drive behavioral change, you need metrics. So, Zinab, what kind of a metric can I use to detect if countries are truly transferring knowledge? Yeah. Because I still have traumas of la France est différente, Deutschland is anders, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Every country mainly saying where they are different mm -hmm. and not transferring knowledge. Mm -hmm. How do I track that and reward the good ones? Yeah, no, thank you. And exactly like Maya said, I think it's about making sure that every launch is better than the previous one and that, that we're sharing data and learnings across the countries to really help them um, 
deliver against their launch um, tactics and their launch um, targets. And the way we did it is we, you know, we have to give the countries a set of freedom to be able to deliver against the launch plan, right? We don't want to over prescribe exactly how they need to launch and take away that element of creativity and innovation from them. So the way we went about kind of defining KPIs and targets for launch is um, by highlighting the critical set of launch activities that had to be done within a given time frame. So we said that, you know, we have these launch readiness review meetings that happen at minus 18 months, minus 12, minus six months. And for each of those meetings, uh, for each of those review sessions, we have a set of critical launch activities that have to have been done mm -hmm. by that timeline. So we don't ask the countries to come to those kind of global or regional settings and provide all the detail of every single launch activity they've done. We ask them to highlight how they're delivering against those critical activities, what are the risks, what are they doing to mitigate it, and where do they need help from global and the regional team to make sure that they stay on track with their launch activities. And those forums have been really, really helpful in making sure that we have this two-way dialogue with the countries and that we have the information that we need to help them and that they can ask for help and, and guidance or best practice sharing where they need it. Okay, and Maya, Maya B, what's the role of the field medical force, so the MSLs in transferring knowledge between countries? Because one way mm -hmm. is exactly what Zeynab said, everybody reports to headquarters, who then sends it back to the country. But can you close the triangle by going directly? How do you do that? Yes, and you should actually do exactly this. Because one thing that every MSL is interested in understanding what are the HCP questions when you were launching? Product, mode of action. And if you can facilitate this communication, and not via a Q&A, whatever, but really you know, get everyone together, they understand, oh, they are actually the same. They speak a different language, same people, same questions. Then they will reach out afterwards and actually call them if there's a question coming up that they cannot answer, or help me to describe the mode of action. My physicians just don't understand what I'm saying. And if you can establish this connection, it will work way better than this. Which, by the way, is a very crude metric. You can simply track MSL attendance country by country at those exchange meetings. Because what I know from experience, sometimes headquarters sets them up, but then mm -hmm. they don't show up. And that's a very simple metric. If they're mm -hmm. not in those alignment meetings, the knowledge transfer will not happen. It's mm -hmm. a very simple metric there. So thank you very much. We are really running out of time, so we can only touch two words about the post-launch. Now we've done through the stage, it can be a short time, but it's usually actually between a year and three years between your first European launch and your last European launch. So it's a very prolonged phase. Then what is the number one, Maya G, what is the, the number one role of medical affairs in that stage, do you think? I'm going to say keep it real. And by that, I mean the collection of real-world evidence and studying the product in clinical mm. practice, of course. Mm. I think this is you know, really where the focus shifts uh, for medical affairs. We continue to do everything that we were doing before, updating the scientific platform, continuing to assess gaps in the evidence and designing late phase studies. But this is where really real world evidence, non-interventional studies, observational studies. Continue to evolve the science. More and more, yeah, continue to differentiate the product, carve out the niche, um, and really strengthen both the, the efficacy and the tolerability profile of, of the product. And I would go so far as to postulate that I'm, I'm not sure that I'm aligned that we need to have different KPIs for medical. You know, what's that one overarching KPI? Mm. Well, I would, I would suggest, why, don't, why doesn't everybody have the same KPI as it pertains to a successful launch, whatever that is, and then every function has different ways in which they hit that KPI, different activities that are responsible for achieving that same KPI. We should all be accountable for achieving the same thing. Um, happy to be challenged on that okay. later. Okay, nice, different, different topic. Mm. Uh, Maya B, what is the role of field medical once all the science has been communicated? Because there's only so much times you can come and visit me about the same phase three trial, sorry. Yeah, so the role is to move on. <laughs> 18 months post launch, ideal world, you just move on to the next launch. And I'm expecting the sales rep to be able to read the SMPC to an HCP. Wonderful. So Zeynab, does that mean the metrics change for medical affairs a bit, in, or do you keep the I same? think we move from that launch mode and launch strategy to business as usual. And what's really important is for us to reflect on how did that launch go? 
what can we learn from it and what can we carry forward to our next launch before we are in that launch mode again? Because that's a quite a stressful time and it's really difficult to reflect and think about what can we do better. But if you do that post launch and in preparation for our future launches, we're in a much better place to really truly reflect and learn from our experiences. Thank you. Well, we've given you an overview within time um, <laughs> of, of, of the role of medical affairs and we could go on each of those, have an in-depth session, but, but we really, really can't. And uh, unless there's a, is there a burning question? At this time of the day? This is uh, kindly me saying, please don't. Uh, all right, then I would say, uh, Dario, 15 seconds to spare. Thank you, wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, ladies. Fantastic. Thank you. It was very well.